This is the second lecture in Chapter 12, looking at solutions and mixtures. Um, today we're going to talk about some of the factors and um, conditions that can affect the rate at which a solution forms or a solute dissolves. Um, three of these that are very easily manipulated and um, quite predictable include surface area, agitation, and heat. So if we take a look at surface area, let's compare these two forms of sugar. In both cases, the chemical composition of the sugar is identical. The only difference is the size of the particles themselves. Um, with pretty much every solute, the higher the surface area, the quicker the material will dissolve. So here, with the very, very small crystals of sugar, we have a super high surface area. There is a lot of outside edge compared to um, the volume of sugar inside each crystal. Um, in this case, with a sugar cube, we have a relatively low surface area. There's a lot more internal volume compared to the edge space. Um, with an increase in surface area, you have an increase in dissolving. The more edges that there are for um, the solvent to get around, the easier it is for the solvent to break that material up and to disperse it throughout the solution. So an increase in surface area leads to an increased rate of dissolving. Um, agitation or stirring, uh, manipulating it in some way, it could be manually stirring it with a spoon, for instance, or it could be um, just swirling the glass, for instance, or putting it in this case, it's on a little stirring plate. So there's a magnet down here that spins and keeps um, the solvent moving. Increased agitation also tends to increase dissolving. The reason for that is the particles um, collide more, so the particles of the solvent and the solute are in contact with one another, and as they're being moved around, there's more um, collisions happening, which leads to quicker dissolving. Um, the last factor that we're going to talk about at this point is heat, and this picture is another example of that. So we've got, this is a heat function, and this was a stirring function. Um, so as we increase heat, that also increases the energy or the movement of the particles involved in the solution. As those particles move more frequently, again, you are increasing the number of collisions, and increasing the number of collisions leads to an increased rate of dissolving. Solubility is a description of how easily something forms a solution. Um, and there are, again, there are some components to every solution that affect its ability to form. So we have um, the type of solute, the type of solvent, and the temperature of the um, environment in which we're forming the solution. So for every combination of those three parts of a solution, there is a limit to which um, the amount of solute can be dissolved in a given amount of solvent. That means that um, even though water easily dissolves salt, table salt for instance, um, there's only so much table salt you can add to the water before it quits dissolving. Um, as we change the temperature, then the amount of salt you can add also changes, or as you change the amount of solvent or um, the type of solvent, things like that. Um, this is described as solution equilibrium, and that is the condition where the amount of solute that is dissolving is exactly equal to the amount of solute that is recrystallizing or re-solidifying. Um, so those two processes are in equilibrium or they are happening at the same rate at the same time. Um, and so that is kind of a static process or the solution is in um, a state of being as dissolved as possible. Um, when we reach that point where a solution has as much solute as it can possibly dissolve, at that temperature, it is said to be saturated. So that basically means it's full of solute. Um, as we lead up to that, when there is first no solute and all the way up until it becomes um, at equilibrium, the solution is unsaturated, so it's not quite full of solute. 
Um, after the point of saturation, the only way to force the solution to include or contain more solute is to increase the temperature. So if we increase the temperature, uh, many times that will allow for more solute to dissolve and it will create what's called a super saturated solution. So it's more full than we would expect or predict it to be. Um, and if we keep it at that temperature, it will usually support that extra solute. Once you cool the temperature down, that solute will start to re-solidify or recrystallize and come back out of solution. Um, so in looking at predicting what kinds of solutions will form, um, in chemistry we use a, a kind of a, a phrase, like dissolves like, and it's a very, not really a grammatically um, lovely sounding phrase, but what it basically is saying is um, solvents will dissolve solutes that are most like themselves. Um, generally, we are referring to whether something is an ionic compound, whether it has charges, um, versus something that is covalently bonded or formed between non-charged particles. Uh, water, although it's formed of two non-metals, right, it's hydrogen and oxygen and hydrogen, none of those are metals. However, because um, oxygen is so electronegative, it tends to pull the one electron away from hydrogen, which causes the oxygen part of the molecule to be pretty negative and the hydrogen part of the molecule to be slightly positive. And so it behaves like an ionic compound. It behaves as though it were charged. Um, this state is called, a, called polar or having polarity. Because of that condition, it very easily dissolves um, other charged particles and um, it makes water what we call the universal solvent. It can dissolve nearly anything um, and especially dissolves well other charged particles. Um, as a process, or pardon me, as a solution is formed with water as the solvent, we um, use a term to describe that called hydration. Um, and you think of hydration as having enough water, and that's basically the same thing in chemistry. Hydration is the process of a solute being um, dissolved by as much water as is necessary to form a um, stable solution. Um, just like water easily dissolves other charged particles, nonpolar solvents will readily dissolve other nonpolar solvents, so gasoline, for instance. Um, and there's another covalent compound called toluene. These are two solvents you'll see fairly regularly that dissolve other um, nonmetal or non charged, nonpolar um, solutes. So here's um, an example of a liquid solution that is formed between a liquid solute and a liquid solvent. Um, most of the time we've been talking so far about solid solutes, but two liquids can also form a solution. Um, when two liquids form a stable and steady solution, it says it's called um, a miscible solute. So a liquid that is easily dissolved in another liquid is said to be miscible. One that does not dissolve easily is immiscible. So M just means not. And so it is not able to easily dissolve. And again, just like a solid, we can predict what solutes will dissolve in what solvents, even if they're liquids, um, based on their charges or their polarity. So charged particles polar par particles will dissolve other polar, and nonpolar, this is no charge, will easily dissolve other no charge particles. Um, there are some liquids that you can kind of force to be in a temporary state of balance, but that requires a fair bit of agitation. So this is a really nice example. This is just a um, very typical salad dressing made of oil and vinegar and I would imagine some herbs or something. Um, so you've got oil here on the top and you have got vinegar on the bottom. So oil is a nonpolar particle, it has no charge, and vinegar actually ha is polar. It has um, pretty strong charges in some cases. And so you can see that those two liquids are immiscible. They do not 
easily dissolve in one another. But if you agitate this bottle, if you shake it up and down, you can get it to form what's called um, an emulsion. It'll sit somewhat together um, and look like a fairly uniform solution for a very small period of time. As soon as it's um, not being agitated anymore, it will go back to separating into its layers because those two liquids do not like to be together. Um, there are some other factors that will also affect solubility. So we've talked about temperature, agitation, um, and surface area. There is one that we haven't talked much about this year at all, but that's pressure. Um, so the effect of pressure on liquid solutions is pretty minimal. We're not really going to deal with that one. But one that's interesting is the effect of pressure on the solubility of gases. As we increase the pressure in a solution, the gas solubility also increases. So what that means is, um, if you imagine this soda here, as it's being in the factory, as it's being placed into the soda can, right? The soda comes in and then an enormous amount of pressure in the form of air is um, added to this can so that the carbon dioxide, which is a gas, can be dissolved inside the soda itself. So these little, those are carbon dioxides. Um, we need a tremendous amount of pressure to get that gas to um, dissolve within the liquid. So as we increase the pressure, that increases the solubility or allows for the gas to become dissolved within that liquid. And then the can is sealed up. But you all know, as soon as you open the top, of a soda can or you pop the top on a, or pardon me, open the top on a bottle or pop the top on a can, all of a sudden you get this release of carbon dioxide from your soda. The reason for that is because you've now decreased the pressure. The pressure inside the can was much higher than the air pressure is naturally. So as soon as that pressure could be released, it was released and that reduced the solubility of the gas within the soda and it released it out into the environment. Um, this process or the escape of gas from a liquid, any gas from any liquid, is called effervescence and you've probably heard that term before. Um, the man who first kind of described this process and the relationship between gas solubility and pressure um, was a gentleman by the last name of Henry, and so we um, credit him by calling this Henry's Law. Um, temperature, I mentioned at the very beginning in terms of um, solid particles or solid solutes, um, there's a very <clears throat> direct relationship. What's interesting is um, with solids, right, as temperature goes up, solubility goes up. There's a direct relationship. But with gases, the relationship is an inverse. As the temperature increases in an environment, the solubility of a gas decreases. So again, think about your soda. <clears throat> As your soda gets warmer and warmer and warmer, if you take it out of the fridge, for instance, and leave it on your counter for a couple of hours, what you'll notice, in addition to all the gas escaping initially because of the release and pressure, also, as the soda warms up, there will be a um, decrease in gas solubility. So that gas will escape more readily or more quickly from the liquid into the air, and it will become really flat in relatively small time. Um, so that's a really interesting process that we'll look at some more in the lab. We're not going to deal very much with um, the solubility of liquids themselves because, again, those are a little bit less predictable and so um, we won't worry about them as much. It's important to notice that there are a couple of exceptions in the condition of solids with temperature. There are a couple of solids that will decrease in solubility. These are exceptions to the rule. There are always exceptions to the rule. We're really not going to focus on them very much, but I just wanted to mention it. Um, the Amount of solubility, while it will increase pretty um, predictably with solids, it's not a proportional increase. Not all solids increase at the same amount. They, um, their chemical properties 
have a lot to do with that. And so there are differences in the amount of solubility while it goes up. <clears throat> some go up by quite a lot and some only go up slightly. And we'll look more at that with a solubility table coming up. Okay, so the last two things we're going to talk about here, um, this is a kind of a fun science word. It's enthalpy, and it describes the amount of heat energy um, being produced or absorbed by any chemical. In this case, we're dealing with chemicals of solutions. So the formation of any solution will always change the energy of the components that go into that solution. So the solute energy will change, the solvent energy will change, and therefore collectively the making of a solution has an energy change. Um, the reason for that is, is let's look at, we'll say, we'll go with our easy example of salt water. So we've got forces here, intermolecular, inter means within and molecular means a molecule. So there's forces holding the sodium and the chlorine together, right? It's the attraction between their charges and the um, donation of an electron. There are also forces holding this water together. Let me um, erase this and draw it more like the molecule actually looks. So we've got H OH. There are also intermolecular forces here, right? The oxygen is kind of trying to hoard the electrons from the hydrogen. So there are um, attractions keeping these individual atoms together. When we add them both into a solution, now there will be contact between the salt and the water, and so those intermolecular forces are being broken. As they are broken, energy is um, moving around, both within the solution and between the solution and the environment. If, <coughs> pardon me, <coughs> if the um, energy is being absorbed, <clears throat> then it's said to be an endothermic reaction, right? And endo means into, therm refers to heat. Exothermic reactions release heat. The net amount of energy absorbed as heat, so the amount of endothermic energy being absorbed, is called the enthalpy of solution. How much heat energy is the solution actually absorbing? There's a table in your book um, that shows the enthalpy values for several common solutions, um, solvents, and solutes. You'll notice that on that table, if you look at it, it's on page 416, you'll notice that many of the values are negative. That means that this solution did not actually absorb any heat, it, actually, it released heat. So you would feel, if you were touching the, a beaker, for instance, holding that solution, you would feel it get warmer because it's releasing heat through the process of the solution forming. Um, there are also many solutions that will get colder as you feel them, and we'll do some of these in the lab. When the solution forms, the beaker actually becomes cold, so that means that energy is being absorbed by the solution. It's pulling heat from the environment, both the air and the beaker, and it's using that heat energy to um, fuel or to help the solution be produced. So you'll see that on the enthalpy table as a positive value. Remember that enthalpy of solution is how much heat is being absorbed. So a positive value is more heat being absorbed. Um, and we will look at this a little bit more so you get some experience with identifying these two opposite conditions. So if you would please put together a couple of um, clarifying or other questions that you might have and I will see you in next class. Thank you.